This is Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur with your host, Lynn Freest. Lynn will share ideas and expert advice from people that are walking in your shoes and living their encore careers, where they want and at the pace they want. You'll start a company of one with confidence and knowledge to live a fulfilled life of freedom and ease. Lynn is a coach and leadership consultant whose mission is to show senior leaders and experts how to start something refreshing and new after a full career in the corporate environment. Welcome to this episode of the podcast, Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur. This is episode 120, and its title is The Story You're Telling Yourself Getting in Your Way. And it's a conversation with Dennis McEntee. Making the leap from being a corporate leader and expert into becoming a solopreneur can be daunting, but the rewards are great. You can work when you want, where you want, and do the work you love. I can be that guide and thinking partner for you. As your coach, I'll help you go farther and faster based on what I've learned from being on this journey for several years. If you're having thoughts about starting an encore career, please contact me and take the self-assessment quiz. The quiz will help you get some quick clarity around what's possible for you in the future. And after you listen to the podcast, I encourage you to visit my website at lynnfreas.com and download the PDF as a guide to help you take the next steps in your pursuit of starting an encore career. Today, we're going to be talking to Dennis McEntee of the Leadership Development Group. I met Dennis several years ago through Jonathan Milligan in one of his programs and have enjoyed following Dennis in his journey. Dennis wrote the book on drama-free teams and still does that as a large part of his work, helping organizations and leaders eliminate some of the drama from work and get more results. And Dennis has been working with teams and, and leaders for over 15 years. I also remember how Dennis repeatedly asked me as I was developing my work, he says, what's your fastest path to the cash? Just as kind of a side note, but he kept saying I had to focus on that, as I would suggest all leaders and all Encore career people have to. Well, some of the questions we'll discuss include how the stories we tell ourselves and others can help us or create drama that isn't helpful in our lives and business. Why believing that I or anyone else can help you is much less important than believing that you can help yourself. In starting an Encore career, why knowing who is more important than knowing how to do everything? And finally, his perspective on when the word retirement means being put out of use, should we think of this as a time to refire and reuse our knowledge, skills, and experience to help others? Well, thanks, Dennis. I really appreciate you having you on the show. And I'd like to always start off the, our interviews with you. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey, the things you're working on these days, and we'll go on from there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So listen, Lynn, I'm super excited to just be with you today and just have a conversation. Uh, every interaction that I've had with you is always fascinating and motivating to me. So thanks for having me on. And um, I kind of have a crazy journey, right? Started uh, my career in full-time ministry and about 15 years ago, transitioned to doing more corporate speaking and consulting. And what I realized is the same things that I help marriages and families and people with when I was inside of the church walls, gosh, Lynn, they work in the, in the corporate world too. They, they work in the real world, I guess, right? It's like, gosh, you know, it, the Bible works where, you know, wherever we're working it. And so we've seen the same kind of transformation in people's lives by, you know, using the scripture, but also using it in maybe a little bit more of a covert way where it's not so overt. So that's uh, sort of a headliner of what I do and who I am and those kind of things. And I know what I talked to in the past, you know, you do some work in the healthcare arena and the theme that I've known you for is your uh, drama free teams and stuff. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that part of the journey. Yeah. So what we really realize is that the outcome to any successful outcome or any successful result is typically this thing that we call drama. And when I say drama, I'm talking about complaining, making excuses, blaming others, playing victim, really not owning your results. And so most of the challenges inside of organizations or Lynn, you've probably even seen this for yourself, right? And you getting started and starting to like step out and do things. It's sort of like that drama that gets in your way. I know it got in my way, right? It's like I would make excuses about why I wasn't at doing certain things. And, you know, at the end of the day, it wasn't even reality. It was just my own story that I made up inside of my mind. And so it's really helping teams and helping leaders just deal with that story and tell themselves a, a better story. 
Yeah, and I can appreciate that. Again, as I've said many times, uh, most of my roadblocks are between my ears. They don't really exist on the outside world. And and really, you know, drama, there is drama between people, but more of it, it's just within us. And, and I'm sure that's what you found too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I tell people all the time, Lynn, and you've probably seen this, is that my biggest problem is, is that everywhere I go, there I am, right? Everywhere. And it's ridiculous for me to think that, you know, I can yell at my wife, yell at the kids, kick the dog. I don't show up to work beating Mr. Happy because how I do anything is how I do everything. And so many times, you know, if I've got personal issues, gosh, I'm going to have professional issues. They, they play themselves out. And so really helping people navigate through sometimes the professional issues, but really they end up being personal issues. Don't, don't you find that when you're working with people is that you're helping them with their, with their business, but really it's at times it's more of a life issue, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. When I've uh, coached executives, we often start off saying, well, I got this project I'm worried about, or this person I've worried about. And, and before it, it's all said and done. We're talking about issues that they're concerned about personally, you know, and how can I improve either my well-being or my balance, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. And, and don't you find that like most of the issues are kind of like based in fear, right? Most worry or concern is like, well, I'm afraid of something. I'm afraid it's not going to happen correctly, or I'm afraid it's not going to get done on time, or I have this deadline. And really, I think helping people navigate through that fear it is really a, a big part of what you do, what I do. And even like, you know, you've been in some of our workshops with Jonathan Milligan and I. And what I've noticed is that when we interview people for like, say, like high-end workshops, and Jonathan and I were talking about this, is that they're totally convinced that we can help them. But what they're not super convinced is that they can really do it. And it's almost overcoming that but I've even seen that with clients is like, they believe in me that I can help them. But at the end of the day, they're not quite sure they believe in themselves enough. And so I think like helping people like get that confidence and that belief to really step out and really just, you know, see what happens. It's like, I, I know I confronted that. I was in full-time ministry and I thought, well, wow, what if, what if I could take these same teachings and morph them in, would it work in corporate America? Would it work in hospital systems? And would it work in banks and financial institutions? And when I first stepped out, it's like, I didn't have a lot of confidence, but I just was like, you know, let's just try. And so I think a lot of times, like, that's an issue for people. And I'm sure you've seen that. Yeah. And, it, and everybody feels like things are different for me, kind of a thing. On the other hand, yeah. Every morning I, I read a, a book called The Daily Stoic, and it's just quips from people from 2,000 years ago talking about problems with themselves and people, and they really haven't changed a whole lot. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Funny how that works. <laughs> we, we haven't, in the end, solved all those things completely over several thousand years. So people have problems, and especially if you're trying to do something. This is what we've seen is that obstacles tend to stop people. But think about this one. Do you know the only reason that you have obstacles? The only reason you really have an obstacle is because you have a goal, right? As soon as I set a goal, I'll, so so I set this goal about two months ago. I said, okay, through COVID, I kind of became a chunk, right? Some people became a drunk. Some people became a chunk. Through COVID, everybody has a different journey. I went the chunk route. And about two months ago, I just woke up and I said, what happened? I gained 15 pounds. And so I just set a goal. Okay, I'm going to lose 15 pounds. Lynn, as soon as I set that goal, four obstacles appeared. I like to eat ice cream. I want to drink wine at night. I don't like to exercise, and I don't want to put things in my fitness pal. But I never had those obstacles the day before. But as soon as I said, this is the goal, obstacles appeared. And I think sometimes like helping people see that, you know, obstacles are normal. It's almost like they're the raw material to get your goal inside of every obstacle. And so just, you know, it, we've seen that with uh, a lot of people working with people is that they get stuck in the drama of like, it's an obstacle and they go, well, it shouldn't be this way. And it should this, and it shouldn't that. And they just shit all over themselves, right? It's like, I'm just walking around shitting, you know, and I have these obligations, but I'm not really committed to it. And so I just stop. And so I think even helping people see go, obstacles are normal. Yeah. If you weren't up to something, well, one, you wouldn't really be living much, but two, right. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. I would guess even the monk in a monastery has some obstacles. <laughs> some, yeah, anybody that has a goal. And in fact, here's what's interesting is I think the most ambitious people have the most obstacles. <laughs> it's a sign of having a lot of ambition. So almost like, hey, it's normal. And I think helping people see that, yep, obstacles are normal.
Now, the other thing for myself and my audience is as we make that transition from corporate world to independent work, you know, we were used to a certain way of doing things. And we were used to, quote, never making mistakes. (laughs) You wanted it perfect when you did something. And now as you go into that independent world, you're just going to make mistakes and you actually have to to get better at what you're going to learn to do. Well, I almost think of things as like, it's just a big experiment, right? And it's like, I get a result and it's based on my actions, right? And so if I don't like the result, I can just change my action. And so sometimes, I I mean, are we glad that Thomas Edison didn't give up after five times, right? It was like, he just looked at this whole idea of electricity as just one big experiment. But if you can kind of look at your life a little bit that way, it kind of takes some of the sting out of like, it's not failure, it's just feedback. I did this, it gave me some feedback. I probably shouldn't do it like that again. And it's not failure, it's just feedback. Yeah, and this whole business of uh, Jody V, a good friend of mine and coach, says, Lynn, you got to be comfortable practicing in public, especially in this online and independent world, because if you wait till you're perfect, you, you know, it'll never happen. So you, you got to go out and just try stuff. And like you say, make experiments. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, and, it, and it's okay. It's not fatal. I, I guess unless, unless you're doing brain surgery, it's okay to make a mistake, right? If you're, if you're doing brain surgery, don't make a mistake. But right. <laughs> most things, honestly, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Well, and I think, too, we talk about the drama and stuff. There are ways to handle these things. I know in my experience, I worked in labor relations, and often people came to me with a lot of drama. But if I was willing to stick with the conversation, not be overreactive about it, uh, you know, we could sometimes figure it out, you know. And I think you're found the same thing. Uh, Yeah, it, it almost like step back and realize that people do things to get a need met. They don't do things to hurt you. And now didn't say it didn't hurt you, didn't say they shouldn't have done that. But at its core, Hunt, they did that, they said that, what need were they trying to get met? And it helps me stay out of my own personal drama, right? Because a lot of times like an event will happen and I want to react or I'll have anger triggered or whatever these feelings are. And I just step back and go, huh, I wonder what kind of need they're trying to get met. And it just helps me to sort of step back and not get so emotional with situations. Yeah, the uh, I had another teacher once say that everybody's doing what makes sense to them at the time. Uh, That's a great way to say it. That's a great way to say it. That doesn't mean it's good for us or even for them, but (laughs) yeah, 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 exactly. Other things as you think about is when I think about uh, people going out for the first time to meet with clients and meeting for the first time, how would they go about kind of uh, avoiding some of these things that would either trigger themselves or trigger the client? Well, how would you say, how do you approach it? Should, I don't call it a difficult conversation, but let's say it's the first conversation you're having with somebody like a contractor or a client. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a fantastic question. So, so here's where the premise that where this sort of like people get into like maybe sticky situations is that, and this is true for everybody, is that people see an event or they hear words, right? Somebody says something, I see behavior and I immediately tell myself a story and that story produces a feeling. And so the key is is to really take control of your own story. But, But think about this, Lynn, is like clients have stories they tell themselves, right? Maybe for example, you didn't answer an email like within the day that they sent it. Well, Lynn doesn't even care about me. He's not even like worried about my project right? And all of a sudden, they just told themselves a story. But the truth is, you just didn't answer the email today. And so many times, here's here's the tricky part is that most stories go negative. Just how the human brain works, they just tell themselves a bad story. And nothing has meaning except the meaning that you give it. And so one trick that we, I don't know if it's a trick, maybe tip is a better word, tip that we give clients is to always tell people what you intend. And even the faster way to do it is to tell them what you didn't intend, right? Because if their brain is going negative, it's like, hey, my intention was not to be late on this project. Hey, my intention was not to, you know, miss this email. Hey, I don't want you to think, and you just shape that story. And I think as, you know, solopreneurs and consultants and, you know, a lot of people stepping out into this new career, just realizing that as you go out and you have these conversations, you're really shaping a story. First, you got to deal with your own story, right? You got to build your own confidence, have the right story to tell yourself. But then you're out into the world just shaping other people's stories. And what we've discovered is that the fastest way to shape the story is to tell people what you didn't intend. Because the brain is already there. The brain already goes to that place. And that's kind of what creates a lot of this drama is just all these stories that people tell themselves. Right? We've seen this like in the, like, right, politics, COVID, all the different things that we have been through in the last couple of years. It's all just these crazy stories that people tell themselves 
right? And so learning to take control of the story is sort of a, I, I think a skill that people stepping out into this new career would really benefit to learn. Yeah, I recently saw an article where somebody said, uh, I really have to stop and think about what's the fear I'm feeding. Oh, that's good. Renumeration or, you know, whatever you're doing, the story you're making up. And because we can, it's really easy to go out and because I have fears. And if I keep feeding them, they, they keep growing. <laughs> so Yeah, well, 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 you think about it, your eyes only see and your ears only hear what your brain is looking for. If you are looking for negative, guess what? You will find it. It is there. It is everywhere. Right. And so your eyes are seeing it because your brain is really looking for it. You're hearing it because your brain is really looking for it. And so it, just learning to rewire our brains. And just like you said, it's like, you know, just kind of starve those doubts, right? Don't, don't feed that fear. Yeah, there's a great Jewish proverb that says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And sometimes there's this fire in people's lives because they just keep putting wood on the old fire. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I know one of the things that I try to do as a perspective is to say, I'm going to try to assume positive intent with whoever I'm talking to, even though they may not exhibit that or anything else. But I try to, again, get away from that assuming negative intent and try to uh, consciously assume positive intent. Yeah, we, we've got a phrase that we use with a lot of our workshops. It's called AGW, and it's assume goodwill. And I think I just want to step into every situation and every interaction, and I'm just going to assume goodwill. Now, whether people have malice intent or not, I can't even deal with that, but I have to deal with my own stuff. And so I want to step into every situation because at the end of the day, I have to look at me and I have to be happy with me when I look in the mirror. So I always want to step into every situation and just assume goodwill. I know another thing that an author, Edgar Schein, talked about it. He calls it humble consulting, but basically it's about, you know, listening, really being curious, being curious with a customer, a client, whoever it may be, your spouse, you know, whatever the situation, can you remain, uh, hold an attitude of being curious about the issue rather than, and again, that short circuit, some of the story we create over it. Yeah, you know, and a key to really like creating a lot of value is to always be super present, right? Be where you are. So I, I just read a fascinating book um, by Dan Sullivan called Your Attention, Your Property. And, and so the premise really is, is that your attention is your property. It's the most valuable thing you have. Right? It's like being where you are. And I think people with ambition and have dreams, I think that's one of the hardest things to do because you're always in the future. Your brain is in the future. You're thinking about the future, but really being where you are and just how valuable like your attention is, is, you know, being really present. And here's what's fascinating. He kind of goes through this whole idea that other people look at your attention as property because because you think about it, it's like even the free apps that are out there in the world, and we won't even name what they are. They actually take our attention and they sell it, right? You think about the, the different kind of ads on social media. Well, they're just selling your intention. And what I realize is that even the free apps are very costly. It's costing my attention. They say, oh, use this app. It's free. <laughs> but is it really free? No, it's costing me my attention. And I think I'm a little bit on the social media kick here. But um, when you think about social media, I think it can cause damage sometimes, right? Because we go out and we compare our insides with other people's outsides, right? I compare my backstage with your front stage. Right, because nobody puts all these things that they did wrong, all these mistakes on social media, right? But yet I know my mistakes. And so I've just, you know, sometimes as great as social media is, sometimes it can be a real detriment to people's confidence, right? Because because you look out there and you look at your favorite social media hero or speaker or author or consultant and go, yeah, well, I'm not doing that. Well, I didn't write these books. This person wrote all these books and I didn't do that. And, you know, just just work with what you got. Everybody's unique. Yeah, and, and it's one of those things, well, and I know Jonathan Milligan has said, you know, somebody out in the world needs to hear your voice. You maybe have a, a topic similar to other people's, but you have a different voice and you just have to be able to share that with people and, and they will respond to it. There is something about being unique. We can't serve everybody, but there are some people we can serve. Yeah, well, well when you think about this, it's like when, when you realize you're unique and you have unique message reaching unique people, then you no longer worry about how unfair it is. And a lot of the drama that we've seen in the world today is because people want it to be fair. What's well, unfair and it's, you know what, it's it, fair or not, it doesn't, it's, it's unique, right? They want it to be equal. Well, it's unique. And just use your uniqueness and reach unique people and, and you'll have a great life. You'll have a successful life. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have to have a huge group of people you reach. You know, it's, it's one of those things where there may only be a hundred people or a thousand people that want to hear you, but. That's a lot of people. So, 
sort of like part of my life goal is that, you know, I, I want to get to the end of my life. And when I'm standing before my maker, he just says, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. Right. And so I want to make sure that my ladder is leaning against the right building. And I never want to get to the top of the ladder and go, man, it's leaning against the wrong building. Right. <laughs> right. And so, you know, just really defining like what success is to you. And, and you know, the funny thing, Lynn, nobody can tell you what success is to you, you know? And so I, I think sometimes that comparison trap, you know, creates a lot of the drama, wanting to be fair or equal. It just, it's unique. Everybody's unique. You have a unique set of circumstances, a unique history, and just use that uniqueness to really reach the people that you're called to serve. Yeah. I know in my work with helping, you know, new and young entrepreneurs, all kinds of things they're trying to do, amazing things. But they are unique to them, you know, and, and I can just celebrate that whether they're going to start a nonprofit or whether they're going to start a, you know, a dog walking service, you know, it, it's great. I'm glad that they're serving people doing that kind of work. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And so, you know, just stepping back and realizing that, you know, your life matters, right? And, and as our friend Jonathan Milliken says, your message matters, Yeah. <laughs> right? So we're, we're just going to put a plug in for Dr. Jonathan Milligan to go have, buy his book, Your Message Matters. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And it's a wonderful, you know, that is a wonderful roadmap, you know, it, and it, he always starts with, Hey, what are you thinking? <laughs> What's your particular point of view and stuff? So absolutely. Yeah. It's fascinating. You know, I was thinking another thing just from your experience as an independent businessman, any specific skills that you had to build or hone or that you've developed over time that might be again, useful for our audience. That's a, wants to become a company of one. Ooh, hmm. this is an interesting idea, right? So I realized that if I want to go really, really fast, Lynn, I can just go alone, right? I can go super fast. I can do it fast. But if I want to go really, really far, I need to build a team. Now, and that looks different for everybody, right? We're not talking necessarily, you don't have to build a large organization where you have a bunch of W-2 employees, right? I, I know a lot of people have gotten out of a bureaucratic world wanting to try to get more into an entrepreneurial world. But thinking about this whole idea, because when I spent a lot of time trying to learn how to do certain things. Okay, how do I do a podcast? And how do I write a book? And you know, how do I upload this? How do I do social media? But what I've realized is that I don't necessarily have to know how, I just have to know who. And when my business really took off is when I got very, very clear on what my unique talent is, like what fascinates and motivates me, what I love to do, like what I would do for free. Right. And, so, and then almost think, okay, how do I design a lifestyle and a life where all I do is what I love to do? And all these other things that frustrate me, I just have a team of people around me. A team can look really different, right? It's like your CPA could be a part of your team. And, you know, your website designer, he's a part of your team. It's not that he's, you're paying him, you know, full time. And I just really work to put a team around me that, I was just doing what I was fascinated and motivated by. Because it's almost like, you know, a lot of people, especially, Lynn, I love what you're doing because you got the gray hair, you got all the knowledge, all the wisdom. It's like, I want to be who you are, right? I want to be like where you're at. But I was thinking about this, a lot of people like at this age, they talk about retiring, right? And, And that word retire means to be put out of use. And I've never met anybody that said, hey, I really want to be put out of use. It's almost like at the time of your life when you know the most and you have the best wisdom, now's the time where you can have the biggest impact. But if you're trying to do things that you don't enjoy or that are frustrating you, right? I can see where you'd want to retire. So my biggest tip is learn to build a team, learn to delegate. And what I've realized about building a team is that I can take things that irritate me and I can find other people that love those things. So I have a team member that actually manages my calendar. I don't even book my own appointments because Lynn, I suck at it. I hate it. I don't like it. But I have this girl that she thinks my calendar is a gigantic puzzle. She just like geeks out and is all excited about my calendar. And it's like, this is a match made in heaven, right? I hate the calendar. She loves the calendar. Hey, we can really work together. And so going out into the world and like kind of thinking like, who who's the person that has my answer? Who can help me? And only doing what fascinates and motivates you. I don't know if that's a that's a good hack or not, but that's that's what's working for me. No, that's excellent because again, as I share with my audience, that some of these things it's easier to do than ever before. You don't have to hire 25 people. You can hire people that have particular skill sets that enjoy doing that, 
for part of the time or a little, a few hours of time, whatever it's needed. But uh, again, you can, you can get all these things that either you don't know how to do, or it's not worth your time, or you hate doing whatever it may be. Yeah, it's just easier than it's ever been before, I think. So it shouldn't be as much of an impediment to people as it used to be. Yeah, well, and I think a great question for like your audience might be is like, hey, what do you want freedom to do? Because a lot of times people come into these second careers and they go, I want freedom from all these things. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I Right. And so it's like, I want freedom from certain things, right? From a bureaucracy and from things I don't enjoy, but then step back and go, well, what do you want freedom to do? Right? Like when I told my team, like, hey, I want freedom to have interesting conversations with interesting people. And literally I wake up every day and I go, who, who am I talking to today? Even my workshops and my keynote talks are one gigantic conversation. And anything that irritates me is a sign that I need to delegate it or dump it. If it's irritating to me, I either need to delegate it or I need to dump it. And here's where it's, we get back to that uniqueness, like, Lynn, who can tell you what's irritating to you? Nobody can. Only you know, right? There's things that irritate you that I would go, man, I would love to do that. And there's probably things that irritate me that you'd go, Dennis, that's easy. That's simple. I love that. Well, it's just, we're all unique, right? Oh, Absolutely. Now, I know, I know another thing people ask me, will anybody want to hear from me? And then I say, hey, at least in my former arena of manufacturing, they can't find enough people. And plus, you know, we're trying to find people from new uh, new backgrounds or new, uh, new arenas, people that haven't been in whatever the business is we've been in before. Well, how can we help those people develop and who better than some of these people who can have encore careers developing people. What what better way to leave a legacy than helping the next generation develop? You know. Yeah, and that's what I love about your audience, right? Is that they're they're not trying, they're not retiring, they're just refiring, right? It's like, hey, they're going to refire and then now use this time where it's like most people retire to like make the biggest impact. And so I, I love your audience. I love what you're doing. It fascinates me. Yeah, and I, I just think there's so much opportunity. Again, we're living longer, so if you retire at sixty, you could be around for another 30 years. And I can't see playing shuffleboard and bridge for that long, but uh, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And even think about this. It's like, so one of my goals is not only to expand like what I love, but also expand my time off. And so every year I try to increase my income and increase my time off. And so if I'm always increasing my time off and I'm always increasing my income and I'm only doing what I love, why would I, I'm, I'm retiring right now. (laughs) <laughs> right. I'm, I, I'm 51 years old and I, you know, take 170 days off every year and my income continues to grow. So why, why would I ever retire? Right. It's like, I'm, I'm taking the month off. I'm taking three weeks here. Why would I ever? So I, I think it's just a different mindset. Yeah. Right. It's just like changing the mindset and continuing to make impact. And I think you, you bring up a great point because those of us in the corporate world kind of equate value with time. And that's not necessarily true. It wasn't even true. The 80-20 rule still does apply. 80% of the stuff I did in the corporate world made no difference at all. Probably only about 20% of it did at best. And, you know, we got to think of that even as we work independently that uh, there's only, as you said, that key role, the key role that you love is where you add the value and, and what you should be focused on. I've kind of battled with this a little bit, right? And I'm sure your audience probably has coming out of more bureaucratic settings, but even a bureaucratic time system doesn't work, right? Even like the eight to five, right? If I'm really making impact, I mean, there's some days, Lynn, where I'll get up and I'll work from nine to 11 and then I'm gonna go play golf. And that was a work day. But in those two hours, I made a gigantic impact, right? I got this big project done, but that's a work day. But, you know, when, if we have this bureaucratic, I used to even coming out of like some of the corporate settings. And even when I first started, you know, I would make a huge impact for a couple hours in the morning. And then I would just procrastinate and sit at my desk, look at my computer. Right. Because, you know, you got to be in your office till five. Right. That's that's just right. It's like that's that's a work day, nine to five. And, you know, some work days are like, hey, I'm going to do a workshop in the evening. So the rest of the morning, I'm just going to play. But sometimes it's like that can hurt your brain a little bit. Yeah. And I think we're all creatures of habit, you know, whether they be good or bad. And so if we've had 20, 30 years of corporate habits, it is something to you have to break or I won't say break. You have to replace those habits and replace them. Like you say, hey, I'm going to focus on two hours or four hours of work, but that's going to be pretty draining for me. And I'm going to have to recover, you know, but creating that new habit of two or four hours of focused work and then recovery, that's simply different than you probably experienced in uh, your corporate life. Yeah, it's almost like, I mean, you've left the time and effort economy, and now you're in the results economy, 
but the results economy look completely different. And, and like I've dealt with this where I've almost felt guilty, right? Where it's like, well, it's 12 o'clock and I'm all done. And well, now what do I do? Well, wait a minute, I can't go to the movies. Wait, no, no, I'm supposed to be working until five or I can't go play golf. I'm supposed to be working to five and just like shedding some of that guilt, right? Shedding some of those obligations that other people have of you and just kind of like lead your life, lead your unique life, be the unique you you are. Yeah, absolutely. That whole concept of value is, you know, once you break it from time, I think it makes us a real difference to individuals, but it is a, it is a hard thing to break. You know, it is completely a mindset. So when you talk about mindsets, I think that's a key mindset that people have to really like navigate, navigate through. And, you know, and you think about like this whole word autonomy, which I know a lot of solopreneurs, it's all about like autonomy, but that word is fascinating because it means self-rule. So if you're autonomous and it's like, you're, you have the ability to rule yourself and gosh, I don't know about you, but like, that's the hardest person to rule. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> right or, or or even like you know sometimes like we, we we trade our boss for another boss right and it's like you're your own boss like so, so my wife also works in the business and uh, a couple weeks ago she looked at me it was like it was a weekend she goes you know what dennis she said i really hate our boss i said you know what i hate him too i said let's quit she says okay we're gonna quit yeah he he makes us work weekends he makes us work at night he doesn't pay us for that time he always makes us work you know and when you think about it, it's like Sometimes if you're not careful, you trade one boss for an even worse boss, which is like that thing inside of yourself that's, you know, putting all these obligations and expectations that aren't even reality. Yeah, I I met another entrepreneur that said that very same thing. He said, yeah, I hated the boss I used to work for, but I really hate the one I work for now. (laughs) He knows what I'm slacking. He knows what I'm wasting time. (laughs) Yeah. So just, I mean, just giving yourself grace, realize it's a process, it's a journey. And just, you know, get really clear on your uniqueness because you are unique in framing that business around that. Yeah, I think too, the other, uh, you know, along with this whole, you're creating value for people. You're not executing processes probably. You're, somebody may be, but, you know, that's not where value arises in executing a process. So uh, I think it was Steve Jobs once said, you know, the best cabbie in New York and the worst cabbie in New York will only have about a 30% difference in getting me to the airport. He says, but the best programmer in the world and the worst programmer in the world, there may be a 300% difference. So, you know, your ability to add value, it is significantly different than just executing time-based things, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And, and who determines value? Right. The customer. The customer determines value, right? And so they're determining value. It's find out what's valuable to them and figure out how you can deliver it. And, and that's that's kind of the key, right? So it's all about value creation and your customer determines the value, not you. Oh, absolutely. I just thought about my kids and it's always interesting. In fact, even my parents have said that's about me is we'll describe what provided value to us from our parents. And the parents won't even remember they did it, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, isn't that fascinating? And, and just realizing, I, it, and I think people don't really see sometimes what they do is valuable because it's so common to them, right? Or we think this idea that it's easy. Well, it's easy for me. It must be easy for you. And there are things that you do easily that other people find are difficult, right? It's very easy for me to stand up and lead a mastermind group, but other people find that very, very difficult. And they'll actually like pay me value to lead a mastermind group. And I'm like, wow, you're, you're going to pay, you're paying for this? Really? Because this is super easy. But what's easy for you is difficult for other people. And I think that's part of the secret sauce of finding your uniqueness is kind of going out and go, okay, what is easy for me? What do other people find difficult? But it's so common to us sometimes that we can't see it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's hard to even, like you say, see the difference. And, and yet for others, it's magic. <laughs> Uh, what we're doing is very common to us. Yeah, and it, it, and also that would be a great thing for for your audience, maybe to as they're continuing to go out and like find these new careers and these new ventures, is to step back and get some feedback and ask people, hey, what do I do that's difficult for you, right? Or where have I created impact, you know? Or what's happened because of me? Hey, I showed up in this situation. What happens because of me? And kind of getting some feedback. And when we've had clients do that, and we've talked to those kind of people, they get the feedback and they go, they're confused because they're like, well, that's easy. Well, that, well, that's not real valuable. Well, I can just do that in two minutes. But other people find that, oh my gosh, that is like, that's your uniqueness. And so typically it's what you do easily that other people think is hard. Yeah, I think it's so true. And thank you, because that again is, I think a great lesson for my audience to really step back and 
not think about what you can't do or what's hard for you, but think about what are the things that are easy for you to do. And, and like you say, get some feedback from others to say, oh, wow, <laughs> that is something. Well, 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 and think about this one. It's like, then build a business around that, right? Even, even like in your, you know, your, your second career, like in manufacturing, right? It's like you did things that you were like, that was easy for, for Lynn. That was right. And then, oh my gosh, Lynn, people paid you for that. How amazing is that? Right. It, and so I, I think that's sort of the key. And there's, there's this cool, um, scripture in Ecclesiastes that says that God will keep you busy with the joy of your heart. And I think that's really the end goal. It's like, find what's joyful and then wrap a business, wrap a life around that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And again, joy doesn't mean easy. It sometimes, it, but it means meaningful, I think. And uh... Yeah. Yeah. Haven't you found as you've stepped out and, you know, on your podcast, all the great entrepreneurs that you've been surveying, don't they sort of have that same sort of characteristic? It's like, they're doing this thing that they're passionate you know, that they're joyful about and they've just wrapped a lifestyle and a business all around that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and then you feel like you're never working. Like, no, I never work. I just, I'm just doing what I love. Oh gosh, I get paid for that. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's the piece of it. That's always interesting. Again, it, it's not exactly some people talk about having your passion and stuff, but this is a little different for me th than that. It's, it's more, you're just doing, using the gifts you have in a way that you find energizing, I guess more than uh, maybe using that passion word all the time. You know, and almost like think about this. It's like, who can, who can tell you what's energizing to you? Only you. And, and so I think part of the key is as your audience like continues to develop this second career is stepping back and just really asking some of these soul searching questions like, hey, what does give me energy? What's energetic to me? Because the worst thing that people can do is they step out into the second career and then they've just re recreated what they had in their first career. Right. All of a sudden it's like, gosh, I just created another hamster wheel that I don't even like. And, and, and that would be really sad. Yep. Absolutely. You don't want to prolong any pain or anguish or suffering that you had before. You, you want to make a step forward, not a, not a step in place or a step back. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a really great way to say it. Just make a step forward. I love that. Well, again, thank you, Dennis. I will include links to your website. Any other programs or processes you'd like to share with the audience? Oh, you know, if um, if people are having trouble with overwhelm, you're having trouble with procrastination, you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm just so busy, so busy, so busy. We created the five-day focus leader challenge. So if you're having trouble getting your focus and really like working in the things that matter most, you just go to www.dramafreeresults.com and it's a free five-day challenge. It's five quick videos for five days five quick action steps that will really help you get your focus back. So if you feel overwhelmed, feel like, oh my gosh, I'm just so busy, dramafreeresults.com, and you can get some free resources to get out of the overwhelm. Great. And we'll include that link in the show notes. Look forward to it. And we'll include a link to your website so they can explore things more with you if you'd like. So uh, again, Dennis, I thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast and really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Again, many thanks to Dennis for sharing his journey and his insights and his perspectives. As a recap, some of the questions we covered were how the stories we tell ourselves and others can help us either create a positive environment or a negative environment. Why believing that whether it be I or anyone else can help you is much less important than believing that you can do it. Why knowing who can do something is more important than knowing how to do everything for yourself. And then finally, why retirement which means being put out of use, is obsolete. And we should think of this as a time to refire and use our knowledge, skills, and experiences to contribute to others. In the show notes, we'll have a link to Dennis's website where I encourage you to contact him and, and look at what he has to offer. And then finally, remember with an encore career, the rewards are great. You can work when you want, where you want, and do the work you love. As your coach, I'll help you go farther and faster based on what I've learned from being on this journey for several years. You have the time, attention, and money to make this leap. So let me help you do it. And if you're having even some thoughts about starting an encore career, please contact me and take the self-assessment quiz. The quiz will help you get some quick clarity around what might be possible for you in the future. And after you listen to the podcast, I encourage you to visit my website at lentfrius.com and download the PDF as a guide to help you take the next steps in pursuing your encore career. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.